All right, welcome everyone to our 14th lesson of the semester. So um, last time we became a bit more acquainted with what we could do with partial derivatives, which was uh, the first thing we looked at was finding tangent planes and making uh, linear approximations. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to explore um, the analog of perhaps the most important derivative rule we learned in Calc 1, which was the chain rule. We're gonna see how the chain rule works for uh, differentiating multivariable functions. So let's remind ourselves what the chain rule was uh, way back when. Let me fix my mask here, it's sliding off. Um, using prime notation, a way of writing the derivative of f with g substituted in, or f of g of x, is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So you may remember it as taking the derivative of the outside function and then keeping the original inside plugged in. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So that was that was the original chain rule. Now writing in Leibniz notation, where we have these ratios of, of differentials here, we can write this as uh, dy dx times dx dt. And one thing you can kind of imagine that's happening is that these more or less kind of you can imagine that they're canceling out, and then we end up with dy dt. Now, why is this true? Why do we have to do it in this special way? Why don't we just write F prime of G prime of X and call it a day? Well, let's say like, here, here's kind of a practical example. Let's say we're uh, traveling north. And if you travel north far enough, it's gonna get colder, right? So let's say we end up losing one degree um, Celsius of temperature for every 100 miles we go. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but let's just say that's what it is. And then let's say we're going 50 miles per hour. So if we wanna know the rate of change of temperature with respect to time, how would we do that? Well, we would do negative one degree Celsius per um, 100 miles. And then we have 50 miles per hour. And kind of like what happened right here, these intermediate rates canceled out and then we end up with negative one half degree Celsius per hour. So that's kind of the intuition behind the chain rule. It's why it's not just F prime of G prime of X right here. Okay, that's back in Calc 1. Hopefully you guys already were aware of this. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, the chain rule for multivariable functions. So suppose Z is a function of X and Y and both X and Y in turn are functions of T. So we can almost imagine it as written like this. So we have these two functions kind of plugged in for our X and Y. What's the chain rule going to be now? Well, before we get into that, before we write, write down the answer, I wanna, um, I wanna remind us of something we learned last time called the total differential, where if we wanted to look at what DZ was, we had partial Z, partial X, DX, and then partial z, partial y, dy. So this was dz. So now if we wanna do dz dt, what we can imagine here is that we're just putting an over dt for this dx and this dy. So what we're doing is we're building our derivative out of the total differential. And say maybe these functions depended on some other variable like s or something like that. Then we could just as easily do dz ds, and then we have dx ds, uh, dy ds right there. So the, the total differential, you can almost imagine it as like the base for our chain rule, and then we can find any derivative we want off of that. All right, so let's actually go ahead and compute this for a specific example here. Okay, so I'm gonna calculate dz dt, where z is equal to this right here. All right, well, we just have our formula for dz dt. It's partial z partial x times dx dt. And note that I'm putting regular d's for this derivative because x only depends on one variable, it's t. So we use regular d's for that. All right. And then we have partial Z partial Y dy dt right here. 
Okay, so if we figure out all four of these ingredients, then we can figure out what the ZBP is. All right, so let's practice our partial derivatives here. Partial Z, partial X. Actually, this one's gonna be really straightforward. What's partial Z, partial X gonna be here? Let's fan the chat with it. That's right, we have eight X. And remember, we're doing the derivative with respect to X, so this y, three Y squared counts as a constant. All right, partial Z, partial Y, it's the same kind of business here. We have six Y for that, and we get rid of the four X squared right there. And then um, what we're going to do next is we want the ZDT, right? And they didn't really say this explicitly, but I'm gonna assume they want things as functions of T. Since they want the T derivative, I'm guessing they probably want a function of T. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna stick in my definitions for X and Y in terms of T. So I'm gonna write DZ DX as eight sine of T. And I'm gonna write this partial derivative as six cosine of T or six Y. All right, now we also need to know what um, dx dt here. Oh, actually, we have a good question here. Why would we do this? Why would we not just convert to z as a function of t? And the answer is you can do that. So <laughs> to be entirely honest, we could stick in um, sine into here and then cosine into here and then do the t derivative normally. You will actually get the same thing out of that. However, for examples, we're going to see in the future right here, um, it actually becomes more and more difficult to do that when the situation becomes more complicated. So we want to practice doing it this way now. So when we get to more complicated situations, uh, we'll be ready for those. Although this way doesn't take, um, depending on what the functions are, it, this way may not actually take that much longer than the other way. All right, so we have sine here. So sine or dx dt will be turned into cosine. And then we have dy dt will be negative sine of t. All right, so now we're ready to fill in what dz dt will be. Uh, let's see, so we have partial z partial x, which will be eight sine of t times our dx dt, which is cosine of t. Next, we have partial z partial y, which is six cosine of t. And then we multiply by dy dt, which is negative sine of t. So we could easily simplify this to two cosine of t, sine of t. And if you wanna be really slick about it, you can recognize that this is the uh, double angle identity for sine. So we can uh, write it like that right there. All right, so there we go. So there is our derivative here. All right, let's do another one here. This one's a little bit more difficult to kind of just substitute these in and do the derivative, but um, that still may be a faster way, but we're gonna practice doing it the, the chain rule way. Okay, well, we have the same definition for our partial derivative. All right, so let's figure out all four of the ingredients. The partial Z partial X, let's see. So let's do the X derivative of this. So we have the square root of something with X's. So the derivative of a square root is one over two times that same square root. Then we multiply by the X derivative of the inside, which is two X, so those twos cancel out. All right, partial Z, partial Y will be done much in the same way right here. We have the square root of something with Y's in it. And then we multiply by the, the y derivative of the inside, which now is going to be uh, negative 2y. So we end up with x over square root of x squared minus y squared and y over square root of x squared minus y squared. And in terms of t's, this will be e to the 2t over the square root of e to the 4t uh, minus e to the negative 2t. And over here, it'll be a negative e to the negative t and then the same denominator. Okay, so we found out half of our ingredients here and then let's figure out the other half. The x dt, all right, well, that's not too bad. This is just going to be two e to the two t. And then dy dt, there'll be negative e to the negative t right here. All right, finally, we're ready to glue everything together and get our derivative here. Okay, so we have uh, partial Z, partial X. 
So it's e to the 2t divided by the square root of e to the 4t minus e to the negative 2t. And then we have dx dt, which is 2e to the 2t. All right. Then let's see here. We have minus e to the negative t. So this will actually just be a, well, actually, it'll end up being a plus. We have e to the negative t on the square root. And then we multiply by negative e to the negative t, and these negatives will cancel out with one another. So we end up with e to the negative t out there. And we could definitely clean this up and simplify if we want to, but I'm just going to uh, save the details for you guys if, you, if you're so inclined to. All right, so that's, uh, that's practicing the chain rule when these depend on one variable here, uh, x and y do. All right, let's look at it maybe an applied um, example here. Uh, can the bottom be factored? Um, yeah, you could factor an e to the negative t out of that. Um, yeah, you could, you could do that if you want to. Like I say, yeah, you could, you could simplify or clean this up however you'd like. All right, so let's see here. Yeah, we can stay here. That's what I was just saying. All right. Uh, sand is pouring onto a conical pile in such a way that its height is increasing at three inches per minute and its base radius is increasing at two inches per minute. How fast is the volume increasing when the height is 90 inches and the base is 40 inches right here? Okay, so in order to do this problem, we're required to remember what the volume of a cone is. Does anyone remember what that is? The volume of a cone. It's kind of similar to the cylinder. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we have a pi, we have a one third factor this time. So we have pi over three r squared h. All right. So now what we're going to do, we want to know what dv dt is, right? Well, why don't we just use the chain rule to figure out what this is? So this is going to be partial v, partial r times dr dt, and then we have partial v partial h times dh dt. All right, so just as in the other example, we have four ingredients, so let's figure out what each of them are. So we have partial v partial r first. All right, well, let's see. If I do the r derivative of this, I have 2 pi over 3 r, and then we leave the h there because that's a constant. All right, and then we have partial V, partial H. Um, let's see, so the H derivative of this, well, it's a constant times H, so it'll just be the constant. So we have pi R squared over three. Okay, now dr dt and dh dt, these are actually just specific numbers. dh dt is three and dr dt is going to be two right here. So those are just two and three. So we're ready to substitute in everything. So we have two pi r h over three, and then dr dt is two. Um, and then we have partial v partial h, which is pi r squared over three. And then um, dh dt is going to be, let's see, it was three. All right, and then now all we need to do to get a specific numeric value for this is to substitute in what r and h are. Okay, so we have two pi, r is going to be 40, and h is gonna be 90, so the product of those is 3,600. Uh, and then times two. And then over here, oh, well, those will cancel out. And then we have pi r squared, which is gonna be 1,600. Okay, let's see here. So 3,600 over three is 1,200, and then times four will be 4,800. So we have 4,800 pi plus 1,600 pi is 6,400 pi, and then the unit for this would be inches cubed uh, per minute. Okay. Um, I don't know, whenever you have a cubed unit, like the numbers are always really big. But this isn't quite as big as it seems because you would have to divide by 12 cubed in order to get the number of um, feet per minute. Um, I still, I, I think it ends up coming out to be like a few feet, cubic feet per minute, which, which is a decent bit. That's like this table sized every minute. So I guess that's kind of fast. 
All right, whatever. Anyways, we, we did the chain rule. That was the main part of it. All right. So now we've been doing this with two variables, uh, X and Y, and then they both depend on one variable T right here. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we can do this with any number of variables. So let's say we are uh, upping the ante here and we have three input variables, W is F of X, Y, and Z. Um, and all of these are functions of T. Then we can still do a chain rule. And let's see here, what's the chain rule for this gonna be? Well, let's write down what the total differential for W is. It's gonna be partial W, partial X dx, partial W, partial Y dy, and then partial W, partial Z dz. All right, well, then it stands to reason that if X, Y, and Z um, depend on T, then we could just divide everything in here by T, or at least do so with the rates here. And there we go. We have our chain rule for three variables. And it's probably what you expected it to be. We have all of the different partial derivatives, and then we have how each of those variables changes based on time. Okay, so I'm not gonna do a specific example with that one. Um, what we are going to do is we're gonna take a look at what happens if uh, we have two variables as our base. So Z depends on X and Y, but then now X and Y each depend on two variables. So the first case was where they depended on one. Now we're gonna have it be uh, depending on two right here. All right, so let's see, what would, the, what would the chain rule look like in this case? Well, let's see, so for partial Z partial X or S, we're gonna have partial Z partial X, and then we're gonna have partial X partial S. And this time I'm writing a partial symbol for this because um, X depends on more than one variable. So now we have to use the partial symbol for our derivatives. All right, and can anyone guess what the next term in this would be? What else do you think will be part of this? How else can we have a change in S? And don't worry about finding Dell on the computer. You can just type in D. So we will have something with Y in it. I agree with that. A little bit hard to type this. Yeah, I think that person had it up there. We're gonna have um, DZ DY, and then we're gonna have DY DS. So you have partial Z, partial Y. We see how Z changes based on Y. And then we see how Y changes based on what S is. And then that's gonna be it. And then for this, we're gonna have the same thing, only now we're gonna see how the middle variables depend on T. Oops, I wrote a D by mistake. All right, so there we go. All right, now this is getting rather complicated, right? So now we have two different chain rules for the same function depending on um, what was going on. Uh, with T here, but now we have two of these. So how do we how do we know what these are and how do we remember them? Um, there's something called a tree diagram, which is incredibly useful for building the chain rule uh, in any given situation that you have. What you do is higher up in the diagram, you put the more dependent variables. So for example, Z depends on X and Y and X and Y depend on S and T. So the most dependent variable there is, is Z. So we put a little dot up here for Z, and then next Z depends on X and Y. So we put these on a lower level and we connect them with some lines like this. And then finally, X and Y both depend on S and T. So what we do is we draw lines connecting X to S and T, and then Y to S and T. So there's our tree diagram for this case right here. Now, how do we interpret this? This looks like some kind of funny house without the floor right here. Like, what, what, what does this actually mean? When we're doing the chain rule, whenever we want to do Z depending on, say, S, what we do is we follow all of the possible paths downward from Z to S, for example. So one possible path would go from Z to X. So we'd have DZ DX, and then we would have DX DS. So that's one possible path, and we put that right here. 
And then another possible path is where we go from Z to Y and then Y to S right here. So that's why we have this term right here. And then if we wanted to do T, we would go DZ DX and then DX DT and then DZ DY DY DT right here. Um, so this is how you interpret these diagrams. Now you might be like, oh, well, one way to get to S is to go from Z to Y to T to X to S. You only follow the paths that go down every step of the way. You don't, you don't care how many times you can zigzag around. Those, those, don't, those don't count. It's only just going directly down from one step uh, to the next one. All right. So with that kind of philosophy in mind here, why don't we try doing another problem? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to find partial W, partial S, and partial W, partial T, where W is some function of X, Y, and Z right here. So now we have a three-variable function, and each one of these variables depends on um, S and T. So let's, let's draw the diagram for this first before we even do anything. Let's see what our chain rules will look like. Okay, so W can depend on any of these. And then we have S and T down here. And each one of these variables depends on those. Oops, these, this should be really connected. There we go. Okay, so there we go. So there's our picture there. Now, what is this saying? This says that partial W, partial S is going to be DW, DX, and then DX, DS. And then we have the same thing for Y, because we can follow the Y path down to S. Partial W, partial Y, and partial Y, partial S. And then we have partial W, partial Z, partial Z, partial S. All right. Uh, don't we need to have to draw the line from Z to S? So do we now have to draw that line? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So I, I kind of did this without looking at the particular formulas. I just knew that X, Y, and Z depended on S and T. If one of them doesn't depend on one of the variables, I'll, I'll show you what to do with that. And then we have partial W, partial T will be the same thing only with DTs now. Oh, it just becomes a lot to write. And then we have partial W, partial Z, partial Z, partial T. All right, so let's go ahead and do partial W, partial S. So we need a lot of ingredients for these. So let's start computing them. For both of these derivatives here, um, we need, um, the partial of W with respect to all of its variables. So let's figure that out first. Uh, yeah, Ian's got the right idea. Wouldn't it just be zero? Yeah, partial Z, partial S is zero because there aren't any S's in there. Yeah, so you could, if you want, and you notice this right away, you can replace this with zero, getting rid of this whole thing. So that that, that was what I was going to say later, but you guys are talking about it now, so. Um, okay, anyways, let's do partial W, partial S. So we have an X here. So we have an X times a constant. So the derivative will be the constant. We have nothing with X's here. So that will go to zero. And then we have an X times a constant. So that will be the constant. I noticed kind of a symmetry with this. Let's see if it holds up for the next one. Partial W, partial Y. Um, well, let's see, we're gonna get an X from that. Uh, let's see, the, the Y derivative here will be Z. And then the Y derivative here will be zero. Okay, and then I think I could probably guess what partial W partial Z is without even looking at it. It seems like it's just the sum of the other two variables. Uh, so this is gonna be X plus Y. Uh, but just to make sure, I do the Z derivative here and get Y. I do the Z derivative there and get X. Okay, so we have those. Now to get the, the S derivative, we need to take the S derivative of all of these. And we, we just did one verbally. Partial Z partial S is zero because there aren't any S's there at all. All right, partial Z, oops, I meant X. Partial X, partial S. Well, let's see, so we have an S and then we have some weird constant here in the form of cosine of T. So we're just gonna have cosine of T. 
then we have partial y, partial s, but we have the variable times this, which now counts as a constant. So we have sine of t, and then we have zero, like we said. And then the final thing we need to compute before we can just throw everything together is going to be um, partial x, partial t, which will be negative s sine of t. We have partial y, partial t, which will be s cosine of t. And then we have partial z, partial t, which will be two. All right. So now we have all of this stuff. And by the way, we could substitute in um, what these are here. Uh, one, two, t. We have s cosine of t and two t. And then we have s cosine of t, s sine of t. All right, let's put together what we have. So partial w, partial s will be partial w, partial x. So s sine of t plus two t times partial x, partial s, which is cosine. And then we have partial w, partial y, which is this. And then we have partial y, partial s. Um, let's see, partial y, partial s is sine of t there. All right. And then finally, we have partial w, partial z times partial z, partial s, but that's zero. So we don't even need to bother writing that. All right, now let's do it for t's and then we'll be finished with this example. This one took quite a while. We have s sine of t plus 2t. And then we have this, which is negative s sine of t. Next, we have s cosine of t plus 2t. And then we have s cosine of t here. All right. And then finally, we have partial W partial Z, S cosine of T plus S sine of T, um, and then times DZ DT, which is two right here. Oof, all right, that took a little bit. So, but that's the chain rule here. And once the more variables we have, the more complicated the chain rule gets uh, right here. And now we need to simplify it. No, we're not gonna do that. I'm not going to simplify this. I mean, I mean, you probably could. You foiled everything out, collected everything in a nice way, but we're not going to bother with that. Um, someone asked about a friendlier way of writing the partial derivatives. Remember that we do have other notations for that. So, for example, if you want to do partial w partial x, that's the same as writing w sub x. So you could do it that way if you want to. The reason why I'm heavily using Leibniz notation today is because I want to illustrate how the chain rule works. <laughs> And remember, the chain rule works because of these, these canceling fractions right here. So that's why I've been so insistent on writing it this way. But if you want, you guys can write it uh, this way right here. All right. Got that down. So now let's get more practice drawing these, uh, these tree diagrams here. So draw a tree diagram showing the relationship among the variables. If W is a function of Z, Z is a function of X and Y, and both X and Y are a function of T. Okay, so let's digest this here. So it seems like W is the most dependent here. It's at the start of this chain. So we have W and that's just a function of Z. So there's just one line going down there. W doesn't depend directly on anything else. Z though depends on X and Y. So Z is a multivariable function, depends on X and Y. So we know Z depends like that. And then we have X and Y depending on T. So there's one variable now and they both depend on it right here. So we end up getting, getting this little kite shape thing or like a diamond with a, a Y on top. Now with this in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to write the chain rule for W right here. All right, so let's see, dw dt. Now remember the way this works is that we wanna find all possible paths down from w to t. And it seems like there are only two of them. Both of them have to go through from w to z. 
and then one goes to X and then the other will go to Y. So we're gonna have two terms in this chain rule. And by the way, um, the number of paths down is the number of terms you should have in your chain rule. All right, so let's do the X way first. We have DW, DZ, and then we have partial Z, partial X, and then we have DX, DT. And notice my use of differentials here. I use the partial for Z because it depended on more than one variable, but I use D for each of these because they only depend on one variable here. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same thing now going down through your Y. So we have DW, DZ. Um, we have partial Z, partial Y, and then we have DY, DT. So there we go. There's going to be our chain rule right here. Number of halves down is the number of what? The number of terms. So this term, this first term represented this path right here. And then the second term represented this path going to the right. All right, now let's talk about implicit differentiation. So if the chain rule wasn't enough, we're also going to have uh, implicit derivatives for multivariable functions. Now let's take a step back to Calc 1 for a moment here. Uh, the chat is overly pessimistic today. Don't, don't worry, guys. Once you practice this enough, it, it'll be fine. And I'm, I'm not just saying that either. Like once you, once you do a few problems with this, it, it just kind of becomes natural after a while. All right. So if we have f of xy equaling zero, um, and we have y depending on x, but x is an independent variable, then what's going to happen? Well, let's see here. What am I going to do here? What I'm going to do is I want to try to figure out um, what the x derivative of this is. So let's say I want to do the x derivative of this. All right. Well, let's see here. That's going to give me partial f, partial x. And then f can depend on y. And, and in turn, we know that y depends on x. Meanwhile, the derivative of 0 over here is zero. All right, now let's say I'm in calc one, but somehow magically I already know about partial derivatives. I can actually get a formula for dy dx and what that's going to be. So let's say we solve for dy dx. I subtract over partial f partial x. And then, um, wait, everything's turning into x's now. This, this is a y, there we go. All right, and then I'm gonna divide by partial f partial y. So that gives me dy dx is negative partial f partial x over partial f partial y right here. And written in the subscript notation, which I'm going to do that now here, uh, we get the dy dx is the negative partial of f with respect to x and then big F with respect to y. Now, what's the difference between big F and little f? Well, little f is the way that y depends on x. Big F is what we get when we shove everything in the equation to one side. So we're shoving everything with x and everything with y to one side of the equation. Whatever all that stuff is combined is going to be big F. So that's the difference between the two. This is definitely more uh, better illustrated in an example. So let's, let's take a look. Okay, so let's say we have um, the equation x cubed plus y cubed is tangent of x times y. And our goal is to find dy dx here. Now let's review what we would do um, for calculus one. How will we do this in calc one? Well, we would take the x derivative of both sides, right? And so we do the x derivative of x cubed and get three x squared. We do the x derivative of y cubed and we do that implicitly. So the normal derivative of something cubed would be three times that something squared, but then y depends on x. So we need to multiply by dy dx right here. And then finally, the derivative of tangent of xy, well, the derivative of tangent is secant squared of something. And then we have a little product rule uh, on the inside, that, which is the derivative of the inside. And then we solve for dy dx. Okay, so first we need to distribute this. Okay. 
Yeah, so we distribute this. All right, that looks good. And then I'm going to move all the dy dx's over here and then all the non dy dx's over here. So I'm going to have 3y squared minus x secant squared of xy times dy dx. And then meanwhile, over here, I have y secant squared of xy minus 3x squared. And then finally, I'm going to divide. We have dy dx is y secant squared of xy minus 3x squared divided by 3y squared minus x secant squared of xy. All right, and there we go. So that's doing an implicit differentiation uh, calc one style. All right, now why don't we try it the new way that we have. So now let's try it using this capital F right here. And we'll see that this actually does take a bit less time. So our capital F of XY, how do we figure what that is? Remember I said earlier, capital F is where we just take everything in the equation and push it over to one side. So I'm gonna keep my X cubed and Y cubed over here and I'm gonna subtract tangent of XY. And since I subtracted that, we know that everything is going to be equal to zero here. Now, remember what our formula was, dy dx is the negative of the partial of F with respect to X divided by the partial with respect to Y. So let's do the partial with respect to X here. Let's see, we have three X squared minus secant squared of xy, and then the x derivative of this will be y. Okay, I'll stick that right there. Fy will be 3y squared, and then I take the derivative of this, the y derivative of my inside is just gonna be x. All right, and then I combine them in the formula, And I end up having negative 3x squared minus y secant squared. And then I have 3y squared minus x secant squared. And voila, we actually get the same thing that we got up here. It looks a little bit different because they, in this one, they applied the negative sign to the top right here. So we applied the negative in there and it flipped around right here. Um, but yeah, so if you somehow know about partial derivatives in Calc 1, this is a better way of doing implicit differentiation when you just have functions with uh, x's and y's uh, right there. All right. All right, now get ready for this. It turns out that we can do something similar if we have, um, X, Y, and Z all mixed together. So say we have some kind of equation with um, X, Y, and Z, like all mixed together, and then you shove everything to one side, kind of like we did with this example. Only now um, we have Z depending on F of X, Y here. All right, so what's going to happen with this? Just a second here. All right, so let's say I want to figure out what partial Z, partial X is. So I do partial F, partial X, and then I do partial F, partial Y, and then DY, DX. Now, X and Y of this problem are going to be um, independent variables. So X and Y are independent of each other. Now Z is the dependent variable. Um, so this is going to equal zero. We don't actually have that. And then we're gonna have partial F partial Z times partial Z partial X. And that will be zero. So I'm doing the X derivative of this equation right here. And this looks very uh, similar to what we had earlier. I'm gonna subtract the FX over, divide by the FZ. And then we end up getting this formula right here partial Z partial X is gonna be negative FX over FZ. And then let's do the same thing with Y. So we have partial F partial Y plus partial F partial Z and then partial Z partial Y. 
That's if we take the y derivative of this right here. And then if we do the algebra again, we subtract this over and then divide by Fz, we end up with this formula right here. So now if we have uh, X, Y's and Z's all mixed together, we can more quickly get what partial Z partial X and partial Z partial Y are by using these formulas here. Okay, so let's try an example of this and then um, I think we'll be finished. Uh, for today. Wow, we actually got done early, despite all that work. All right. So let, well, we're not done yet. Let's let's keep going. All right. So let's see here. So I want to find partial z partial x. All right. And that's going to be negative fx over fz. Okay, well, let's see here. So we have our negative. What's the partial derivative of this with respect to x? By the way, the first thing we would need to do, but we don't need to do for this problem, is we need to make sure that everything is on the same side. Everything needs to be on the same side for it to count as f. So um, we need to make all of this stuff is equal to zero, so we don't need to do that here. But let's say maybe this was over here. We would need to subtract it and bring it over to this side. All right, so let's do the x derivative. We have 3x squared. We have the derivative of this is zero. We have the derivative of this. Now this one's a little bit tricky. We have this constant y, right? And then we're doing the derivative of e to the variable times a constant. So the derivative of e to a variable times the constant is the constant times that same thing. And the constant in this context is z. So the derivative of this part is z e to the x z right here. All right, and then we're going to take the x derivative of this, but the x derivative of this is zero because there are no x's in here. All right, so we have that. And then let's go ahead and figure out what f z is. So we do the z derivative here, which is zero. We do the z derivative here, which is two z. And then we almost have the opposite situation for this. This time z is the variable right here. And then x is going to be the constant. So rather than a z coming down this time, we're gonna have an x coming down. And voila, there is our partial z partial x. Now doing this implicitly and then manually solving for this certainly would have taken longer. So this is definitely a time saver. So our efforts are beginning to pay off here. All right, and then let's check out partial z, partial y right here. Um, oh, oops, I forgot about the cosine of y, thank you. So I do the z derivative of this and I end up with a cosine of y. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's do the same thing only with y. This is gonna be negative fy over fc. Now, the nice thing is, is we already know what FC is. We just figured it out with the cosine. All right, now let's do FY up here. So I have the derivative of this with respect to Y is zero. The derivative of this with respect to Y is zero. The derivative of this with respect to Y is we have a variable times this weird constant. Well, it's just gonna be the constant. Oops, forgot the negative in the front. There we go. And then I'm going to do the y derivative of this times the constant z. We have minus z sine of y. And there we go. So it's kind of debatable whether the previous page where we did this with the calc one version, whether that was going to be faster or not. I think it's kind of beyond debate um, whether or not this is going to be faster. This is certainly faster if you want to do implicit derivatives with um, more and more variables. Oh, right, they wanted us to do this at uh, zero, zero, zero. So let's just plug in zero for all of this. So Z sub X at zero, zero, zero. Let's see, well, that looks like a zero. And then down here, it looks like a one. So that's gonna be zero. And then we have Z sub Y, zero, zero, zero. On the top, looks like we're gonna get a one from this, a zero from that, and a one down here. And then with our negative, gives us negative one. So it's a lot of work for, <laughs> a lot of work for just a zero and a, a negative one here, but that's, that's all it ends up being here. 
All right. And yeah, it looks like that's about it. So that's our chain rule right here. We have a few. Now you try it, but that's for you guys to try for. All right. So next time what we're going to learn about is we're going to, um, so we know how to take a derivative in the x direction. That's the x partial derivative. We know how to take a derivative in the y direction. That's the y partial derivative. But what happens if we want to move in some combination of x and y? Like what if we want to move diagonally in some way? How would we get the rate of change in that direction? That's what we're going to be addressing next class. So I will see you guys then.